It's about that time of the year again when I get tired of something that I've only had for about seven months and get the urge to want something new. But that's just the kind of person that I am. Today, we're going to be discussing the second generation wall mount that I have constructed. This time, I had some help. My grandfather, who is a retired engineer, was in town and was able to help me with the construction of this project. So without further ado, let's begin. First was the design process, as usual. This time, I wanted to spend a little bit more time on the pre-planning because I wanted this build to go well and be what I was imagining. So, I spent the first six days sketching, brainstorming, designing, and planning the shape and the positioning of the components of the frame. Once I had the overall look on what I wanted, I went ahead and began to draw the blueprints. Using a massive sheet of paper, I drew out the frame at one half scale to see how the components would fit and how big the overall structure would be. The initial design called for a four and a half foot square panel, which was way too big and couldn't be achieved using a standard four by eight foot sheet of plywood, so I had to downsize. After three different redrawings, I finally got a nice three foot 10 inch square panel that would suit the room nicely and still be able to fit all the components in the same arrangement. Now keep in mind that this panel was custom fitted for my components, though computer components are pretty much universal in factory sizes anyway, so future upgrades shouldn't be an issue. Once I had finalized the blueprints, it was time to create the 3D render. As usual, Google SketchUp came to the rescue. Using it, I created the full scale model of the build. I also used it to show how it would look when actually built, adding different components and putting it up against the wall to see how it would look when it was hung. For this project, I wanted to add both more LEDs and some form of liquid into the equation. To solve this, I decided to do my standard component hole gap where there would be a space in between the frame and the component where light can shine through. Only this time, I decided to include frosted glass to help disperse the light evenly instead of leaving it open like the old one. And for the liquid part, I decided to add a square piping loop around the ends of the frame that circle the chassis. This would allow for liquid cooling in the future, but as of right now, everything is still being air cooled. I've always wanted some kind of multi-switch startup system to turn on my computer so that it feels like I'm turning on like a helicopter or something. To achieve this, I decided to have a bottom switch panel that would turn on the computer, lights, pump, etc. So I had to draw out that circuit diagram um, before starting. Once I finalized the official design, it was time to order all the parts that I would need for this project. As per usual, Amazon was used because I kind of needed everything to my house in like two days. Switches and wire were the most important things to order, being that the switch panel needed specific items. For the main items, I ordered 10 feet of clear Schedule 40 PVC tubing at 3 4 inner diameter, a 5 by 7 foot roll of carbon fiber vinyl wrap, a 12 volt water pump, and a waterproof 16 foot strip of RGB LED lighting. For the wiring and switch panel, I ordered the main switch, which is a 120 volt electromagnetically engaged machinery safety switch, five backlit 120 volt red sub switches, two 25 foot rolls of 14 gauge wire, a 120 volt green LED indicator light, a 15 foot long NEMA power cord, and a three pack of 120 volt to 12 volt DC adapters. For the bulk materials, a trip to Lowe's solved that all. There I bought a four foot square sheet of sanded half inch plywood, 20 schedule 40 PVC elbows at three fourths inner diameter, one schedule 40 PVC T joint at three fourths inner diameter, one 10 foot long schedule 40 PVC pipe also at three fourths inner diameter, three schedule 40 PVC end caps, also at 3 4 inner diameter, two brass tubing barb adapters at 5 16 inner diameter, three feet of clear tubing also at 5 16 inner diameter, PVC glue and primer, and some cheap spray paint for color drafting. The clear acrylic panels I already had at home, which saved me over $100. First thing on the list was to draw the frame cutouts. This was very important to the entire project because drawing it out at one-to-one -one scale showed the frame's true layout and I needed to like it before cutting out the entire frame. Of course, this was already finalized in the 3D render of the design, so on the frame was basically what I wanted. Using the 3D render, I got the measurements from the model and basically just drew it out on the plywood, same as last time. 
After I was done drawing, uh, it was time to cut the frame out. This time there was a lot more cutting, which naturally took longer. It took about three to four hours to cut out the entire frame, making sure to also smooth down the edges with the file afterwards. During this time, my grandfather was busy making the rising mount that the frame was going to go on. He accomplished this by designing two long panels with leg risers on each end that have a threaded rod on the tops of them. This way, when mounting the frame onto the mounts, you can just bolt the frame to the mount, which are screwed onto the wall. After I finished the cutting of the frame, there were some imperfections and some small mistakes that needed to be fixed before painting and applying the wrap. Uh, this was done by adding a quick setting filler to the imperfections. This stuff dries fast. Uh, you only have about two minutes of work in time before it sets, um, which is perfect because I hate waiting for stuff to dry. Once the filler was set, I sanded down the entire frame with a circulating sander to get rid of the little wood fibers and rough edges. Also, during this time, my grandfather was busy measuring and cutting out the acrylic plexiglass panels that would be mounted behind the components. After all of the sanding of the frame, the plexiglass panels were all cut. So, in order to achieve the frosted white color that we were talking about before, uh, I just went ahead and sanded the acrylic down with the circular sander. Sanding down clear acrylic roughens the surface, creating a faded white, which disperses light evenly across it. Next was the fun part, the plumbing. I had ordered just enough clear PVC for this build, so I only had one shot at cutting them to the correct length. Fortunately, everything came together perfectly. Um, to explain what we did for the liquid loop, uh, at the top there's a T-joint pipe that allows for the user to fill the loop that then runs to the first clear pipe on the front. That pipe then feeds back behind the frame and goes to the next front side clear pipe, which then repeats the same process until you come back to the original T-joint. Instead of connecting them, the loop is cut at the top right corner with the T-joint, and both ends are capped with the brass barb adapters. These two barb adapters are then connected with tubing that feeds through the pump. So when the pump is activated, it pushes the liquid around in a circle along the loop. After the plumbing loop was all cut and dry fitted, I went ahead and had my grandfather paint the back of the frame with a paint and primer latex exterior white paint. While he was doing this, I had to run to Lowe's in order to get all the necessary mounting hardware uh, for mounting the components to the plexiglass panels. This was done using stainless steel bolts and nylon spacers. The spacers raised the component from the acrylic panel and the bolts secured in place. Six thirty-second bolts were used for the motherboard and hard drives and M4 bolts were used for the SSDs. After the two coats of latex paint were applied, I spray painted the front side edges with black spray paint so that the wood doesn't show in the areas where the vinyl wrap doesn't reach. Once all that paint dried, I went ahead and applied the carbon fiber vinyl wrap. This took a little bit over an hour to accomplish. What I did was cut and apply a covering sheet of the wrap over the entire frame front. Then, working along the outer edges, I cut, stretched, and stapled the wrap over the sides to the back. This was a crucial step in the application of the wrap because I needed to make sure that the wrap was tight so that no wrinkles or folds were present along the front or it would look bad. Once the outer edging was done, then I transitioned to cutting out the component holes on the interior of the frame. This was pretty much the same procedure as doing the outer edges, cut, stretch, and staple. Off camera, I also wrapped the switch panel with the carbon fiber using the same procedure. Once that was completed, the last thing that we had to do in the garage was mount the acrylic plexiglass panels. For this, my grandfather had pre-drilled holes to allow for the bolts and screws that would be securing the panels to the frame and securing the components to the panels. In order to accurately judge the positioning of the panels, I went ahead and pre-mounted the components onto their designated panels and eyeballed their correct positioning in the cutout holes. This was done for each component and after each positioning, I pre-drilled a shallow hole for the screws and screwed in each panel to the frame. Also, some things to note, there was a lot of spray painting that wasn't filmed, but we essentially painted certain pipe fittings, uh, aluminum brackets and mounting nuts were painted gold, and edging and the switch panel were painted black. Once we had finished what we needed to do in the garage, it was finally, 
finally time to assemble everything and hang this huge wood panel on the wall. First thing was first though, we needed to create the switch panel by soldering the circuit. Now this took three and a half hours, I don't know why, I guess time just flew by. But to explain the circuit as best I can, it is a series of lined up switches that feed off 120 volt input power. The input power naturally comes from the wall outlet, 120 volts, 20 amps, through the 15 foot long NEMA power cord, which I did cut in half, into the main switch, which is that electromagnetic safety switch that I mentioned earlier, that then runs through the 120 volt LED indicator light, which naturally turns on when the switch is providing power to the rest of the circuit. The idea of this is to let the person who is turning on the system know that there is power going into the system before proceeding. Then from the LED indicator light, 120 and neutral right along the top and bottom of the panel uh, in separate wires. The first three switches siphon power from the two wires and go up to the back of the frame to the three separate 120 volt to 12 volt DC adapters which power the front LEDs, back LEDs, and the pump. The two wires on the switch panel then end at the fourth switch which is classified as the computer safety and then the fifth switch which is classified as computer power is connected to that. So both the fourth and fifth switches have to be on in order for the computer to power up. From the fifth switch, the power supply end of the NEMA cable is attached and heads to the power supply. Also something to note, the ground wire passes all of the switches and is directly connected to the rest of the NEMA power cord. This is very important to know because you need to ground your system or else something bad happens. The overall idea behind the circuit is to allow the user to turn off the lights, pump, or just the computer without compromising the rest of the system. So the only way to turn off everything is to toggle the main switch. Here is the custom circuit diagram that was used to create the circuit. Once that was completed, it was finally time to start getting the entire thing onto the wall. First, we went ahead and filled up the loop with the mineral oil. The mineral oil was bought at our local drugstore. And based on the math that we did, we needed approximately 1.3 quarts in order to fill the loop, so two one-quart bottles of mineral oil were purchased. Now, we had done a leak test in the garage before filling the loop with the mineral oil using water. This is recommended because we didn't want to have to deal with a leak after the fact. Be sure that you have liquid in your pump before trying to turn it on. A liquid pump must be primed in order for it to actually work. And so in order to prime our pump, we had to get all the liquid into all parts of the tubing. So we had to flip it and turn it a bit. But once the oil was evenly dispersed, the loop worked fantastically. Now you can't actually see the oil moving because of its viscosity and the fact that the entire loop is filled. But in the future I may put like an additive or something that allows one to actually see the movement. Now if I had water in it, like we had in the test that we did in the garage, um, one could clearly see it moving. Um, but I chose mineral oil because of the fact that it doesn't conduct electricity and it doesn't really become gross over time like water does. But once we were done, we capped the loop and moved on to the next part. It was finally time to officially mount the components onto the frame and get everything wired up and up and running. I mounted each component the same way I did earlier when fitting the plexiglass panels. Adding the nylon spacers and bolting all the components down was a little bit more difficult because the frame needed to stay upright due to the fact that the loop was already filled with the mineral oil. It wasn't too big of an issue though, I was able to do it by myself. After I finished mounting the components, it was time for the ever so fun cable management. Now, there really wasn't a good way of doing the cable management on this build because I was limited with my extensions and links of the cables. It was pretty straightforward though. Feed the cables through the other side, connect them to the components, and then run them to the power supply. I had all the cables loose first and then consolidated them at the end in the best way I could. Didn't look pretty, but no one sees the cables anyway so it didn't really matter to me. Before mounting, I wanted to make sure that it posted, and it did on the first time, as always. Once all of that was done, it was finally time to put the mount onto the wall. 
Now, my grandfather was going to help me with this part, but it was like 1.30 in the morning, and I'm pretty sure I didn't really want to bother him about it. So I just went ahead and cleared the wall myself. Then I measured the distance so that it would be centered from the end of the wall to the inner side of the false wall of the sound booth, and centered from the ceiling to the top of the desk. Once measured, I got the mounts, made them level, and screwed them into the wall. Now my wall is made of concrete board, so these construction screws that I used were plenty strong for this. If you have drywall, I recommend drilling the screws into a wall stud for support. Once the mounts were screwed in, all I had to do was put the frame onto the mounts. The entire frame weighed about 30 or 40 pounds with everything on it, so it was a little bit difficult getting it onto the mounts, but I was able to accomplish it anyway. Once on, I bolted it in, and we were good to go. Well, that's it. That is the two week long build of the wall mount X2. Hope you guys enjoyed this as usual. Uh, it was fun to do another wall mount build and I do look forward to the next one. Anyway, have a great day. Thanks for watching and please enjoy the rest of these fantastic shots of the new computer.